I'm Joseph C. Phillips, and I'm an actor. Uh, most people remember me as Martin Kendall on The Cosby Show or the original Justice Ward on General Hospital. My favorite misconception about acting is that it's hard work. Um, I would qualify that to be acting on television shows in movies, even on stage to a certain extent. But I've always, it's always irritated me when I've watched television, uh, talk shows, and seen actors, big stars, come out and talk about how hard they work. No, digging ditches is hard. Being an actor, uh, in comparison, is not hard. Getting up, yes, sometimes very early in the morning, having a car come pick you up, take you to the set, have people come ask you what you'd like to eat and then go out and get it and bring it to you. People pamper you, put makeup on you, do your hair, put clothes on you. Uh, then when you go to the set, they have a chair for you to sit in. It's, it's not hard work. You might work long hours, but there's a difference. Digging ditches is hard work. Acting on television is not hard work. I love being on the stage. When I was, uh, actually before I was in high school, junior high, performing in front of people, that the sound of that applause, even to a certain extent the butterflies, but the bright lights, there's something for me that nothing else could compare to that. All through high school, I never did drugs, drank alcohol or anything. And of course, when you're that age and people are experimenting with all sorts of things, they would say, hey, why don't, Joseph, why don't you try this, try that? I said, no, I get high off of this. And it sounded kind of trite, but it really was true. The high I would get from performing, and still do to this day, was incredible. And there's nothing like being in front of a live audience and you feel this energy coming back to you and people laughing at things that you say or you move them to uh, silence or tears. And it's, it's incredible. It's, it's an incredible feeling. And uh, it really is, people say you get bit by the bug. It is like a bug. You get that in your skin, in your system, and it's hard to, uh, it's hard to get that out once it's there. Stage, actually, but I think television, I've done a lot more television than film, made more money on film, but uh, I enjoy being on a set. I enjoy being on the boards, as they say, uh, you know, in the live audience of stage. The rehearsal process of being on stage is exciting. Opening night in the theater is incredible. But being on a television program is a lot of fun, actually. And I've enjoyed it. Um, I can't think of, of one television program that I've done. Well, uh, that's not true. <laughs> I, can think of, I can't think of one that was horrible. I, I've been on sets that were not as enjoyable as other sets. But uh, being on a television program is, is a lot of fun. So I would say TV. And the other thing about television, interestingly enough, is that when you're in that little box, which actually now has gotten bigger because people are watching you on 60 inches now, and movie screens have gotten smaller, but uh, you go into people's homes and they have an intimacy with you that they don't have when you're blown up on the big screen. And sometimes that's very nice as well. Some people watching this might say, when, if I say, I don't know that I've ever done anything that funny on a set, they say, yes, we know. But uh, I can't, I tend to be, when I get on a set, I tend to be there to work. A lot of people come and they play. That irritates me because um, it adds hours to the day. There's not, you really don't have anything to do except memorize your lines, know where you're supposed to go, hit your mark, and, and do your work. So I come prepared to do that. And it's always irritated me when people come and they don't know their lines. What else do you have to do? Nothing. Learn your lines. You sit in your trailer, learn your lines. I can't think of anything, 
I've had fun on sets, but generally it's because other people have been having a lot of fun. There have been roles that, um, that I've said, I just can't do this. The first one that comes to mind, I don't know if I'm supposed to mention films, uh, but the script for How High came to me. And I hadn't worked in a while. I really needed this gig. And I read the first, I don't know, six or seven pages of it. And I thought it was the most offensive thing that I'd ever read. And I said to my wife, you know, I, I, read this. I just want you to read it. And I didn't say anything else about it. I didn't want to color it in any way. I said, just read it and let me know what you think. She read for about five minutes or so, and then she looked to me and she said, Honey, you cannot do this. No one wants you to have a job more than I do, but you cannot do this. And I called my agent and I said, I can't. There's no need for me to even go in on this. I can't do this. I would never be able to look my children in the eye if I did this. And the one thing it taught me, though, because there were people who ended up doing the film, people who are terrific actors, people who I know, respect as artists, but everybody has a different, you know, a, a different level, which is why when we get in these conversations about what people should and shouldn't do and what is offensive, it, it, it's a matter of taste. What was very offensive to me was eh, just kind of maybe tasteless to someone else, but they were able to do it, dive into it, I assume have have fun with it, but that was something I couldn't do. And occasionally, and I'll say in Hollywood, there's a lot of stupid stuff in Hollywood. Stupid is different from offensive. Um, I'll do stupid stuff <laughs> because you have to eat. And Hollywood is, I think, the capital of stupid stuff. You have to eat. I'll never forget, though, uh, the conversation I had with uh, the great late Rosalind Cash, and it was around this very topic. And I'll never forget uh, the series Martin was on, and and people will go back and probably there are a lot of people who loved that that show. Uh, Martin did a lot of uh, Martin Lawrence that is did a lot of stuff that's over the top, and and just very wild. And for some black people, they felt that this was offensive for them. And it wasn't funny. It was bug-eyed. It was, it was all this stuff that we were trying to get away from. And I said in this, this was a, a discussion, a panel discussion, I said, you know what? I don't think it's fair for us to come down hard on actors that take roles on these shows because people have got to eat. It's hard out here, and people go long months between gigs, people have got to eat. And Rosalind Cash looked at me and she said, I have never been that hungry. And if you are ever that hungry, you come to my house and I will feed you. And ironically enough, a few months later, I was cast as Rosalind's grandson on General Hospital. And Rosalind and I worked together very closely and I grew to love her and respect her. I had grown up watching her, of course, and loved her, just knew the, her legacy. Negro Ensemble Company, just knocking down doors here. I'm wearing locks right now. Rosalind Cash was the first black woman in Hollywood to lock her hair, and she didn't work for a long time because of it. So I have a lot of respect for Rosalind. I don't know if I completely agree with what she said, but that has always stuck in my head. If you are ever that hungry, then you come to my house and I will feed you. And so there are things that I absolutely would not do. I'd rather go <laughs> to, you know, to someone's house and be fed than, than lower myself to that. I grew up um, in the TV culture. So when I became an actor, one of the things that I wanted to do more than anything was uh, be a detective on TV. I grew up watching Mannix 
and Hawaii Five-0, Cannon, Barnaby Jones, all those Quinn Martin shows. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be one of those guys. I wanted to have my own show and be a detective. Um, I've never got close. <laughs> I've played uh, I've played cops, uh, rogue CIA agents, and that kind of thing. But I've I've never been, uh, you know, that private detective guy. And I don't think there has been a black private detective on on television that's the, in a series that's lasted. There have been a few attempts. Louis Gossett had uh, one um, years ago that lasted a hot second. Um, James Earl Jones, Bill Cosby, of course, had the Cosby Mysteries. Uh, but I don't think anyone's had that type of, of, of show. So that's the one thing that I've always wanted to do. The other thing is I love Westerns. I'm a huge Westerns fan. Huge. I, you, we, I can talk Westerns with people all day. That's how I think I've seen just about everything. And in a lot of ways, it breaks my heart to know, well, two things. First thing is that I'm, I'm envious when I see black actors who have been able to, to do Westerns. Because I, I want to do a Western so badly. I would love to. But I also know that, it, and probably now, uh, is is more possible certainly than, you know, when I came out of acting school, no one was doing, you know, black people in Westerns. Every once in a while, there would be some opportunity for, for a black actor to put on a cowboy hat and get on a horse. So that's a, that's a role that I would, I would love to have a six gun on my hip and a cowboy hat and ride a horse. I always, I, th I thought for a long time that I would be a lawyer. Um, going through high school, that was, that was the plan, was that I would uh, go to bi um, study business and then I would go to law school and be an attorney and do that kind of thing. But the love of the stage um, just kind of drew me and after my senior year in high school, I was sure that I was going to be an actor. I kind of wish <laughs> there certainly have been through my career a lot of times when I wish I had gone to law school instead. In fact, just last night, I commented to my wife because when we got engaged, uh, this was before I started General Hospital, coming off the Cosby Show and Strictly Business, I didn't work for a year. So, I mean, it was you come off the number one rated show on television, and Strictly Business was not a hit by any stretch of the imagination, but I had a lead role in a feature film distributed by Warner Brothers, so a major studio. Certainly, I had every reason to believe that I would work, and uh, I didn't. And I got engaged to my wife, and I said, you know, I can't really do this anymore. This up and down is killing me. Now, this was 20 years ago. And I said, uh, I'm going to go to law school. So I studied for the LSATs over that summer. I took the law school uh, aptitude test and was accepted to Rutgers Law School. And then I got General Hospital. My wife and I were married. We moved out here. And I commented to her last night. I said, you know, if I had gone to law school instead of done General Hospital, I would be an attorney now with 15 years of experience. She said, yeah, but you probably would be unhappy and blah, 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 blah. I don't know, but uh, it's interesting to think about that sometimes. I was very fortunate because I got an agent almost right away um, coming out of uh, coming out of acting school coming when I graduated from college in New York you were able to freelance with a lot of different agents I don't know if that's the same if it's been a very long time since I, I graduated from college but you could freelance with 
with several different agents and they would call you to see who got to you first before submitting you for a job. In Los Angeles, my understanding was that you could not do that. You had to be signed with someone. I was very fortunate that uh, the summer I graduated from college, I literally wore out, and I say literally, I, I'm not I'm not exaggerating one bit. I wore out a pair of shoes walking the streets of New York, passing out my picture and resume. And um, I had a look, a very commercial look back then. I was what, 20 years old or something, and I had pretty good photographs and I was coming out of a good program at NYU and so I had a lot of people who began to submit me and I was freelancing with several agents. It took, it was probably, I don't know, it might have been five months or so when I was up for a role on a Broadway play which I, I didn't get. But the idea that I was this close to getting the role prompted one of those agents to say, well, we want you exclusively with us. And so, I mean, it was, I was very fortunate, I have to admit. <laughs> My family was supportive. I told my father I wanted to be an actor, and he said, okay. That was it. Now, after I got out of acting school, uh, it was about a year, and I hadn't made a lot of money. I'd done extra work and stuff like that. I'd got my SAG cards. I'd had some success. Uh, I mean, I mean that by that I'd, I'd got some work, but I didn't have any money in the bank and my father said to me something along the lines of well I hope you don't stick with this too long so you know maybe you can uh, get a job with the city or something and that was frightening to me I mean and don't anybody take this the wrong way there's people who are happy working for the city that was not my thing and it had that had never been on my on my list on my radar was working a job working for the city, you know, in the city bureaucracy. That that had never been. I mean, I was too sexy for that as far as I was concerned. Um, so I stayed with it a little bit longer, managed to have just enough successes to keep me going, started making money, was fortunate enough that I didn't have to wait tables anymore, and between the gigs I had in unemployment, I was paying the bills and, and even putting money aside and doing things. So I've had a very fortunate career in, in that sense. Hell no. No, no, no. I don't encourage anyone to do this. And I'll be honest with you. This is a terrible, terrible career choice. It's, it's just you can't make a worse choice than to get in this business. You just can't. And when people talk to me about it, I tell them, I say, you have to, you have to come into this without the rose-colored glasses. You have to, it has to be so real to you. So when you make that decision, you know exactly what you're getting into. The fact is that this industry doesn't want you, doesn't need you, doesn't like you, will not miss you when you're gone. It's ruthless. Uh, you will spend the majority of your time not doing what it is that you love to do. Even if you, people will look at me and say, Joseph C. Phillips had a successful career as an actor. I was never a star. I didn't get to be, you know, there are gradations of success, let's say that. But I know there are people who would give their right arm to have the career that I had. I, I went through my entire career one day just to see and worked out that 45% of my career I was unemployed. 
and that's somebody who was on several TV series, did a couple films, did stage, commercials, industrials, uh, industrial films, etc. There are people who work a lot more than, than I did or have in, in my career, but most people work a lot less. This is a this is a terrible career decision. Most most members of SAG on any given day, ninety seven percent or something, are unemployed. Um, I think it was Howie Mandel who said uh, that in this in industry, you can it's easy to make a fortune, it's hard to make a living, and uh, so no, I don't want my kids anywhere near this business. Sure, why not? I'm an actor. Why wouldn't I? This, this, is, this is an incredible question to me. And I've heard this put out there, and I've heard the same question about whether you play a homosexual, would you kiss a man? Well, I, I played Paul in Six Degrees of Separation, um, actually stood by, um, understudied the role, and you have to kiss a guy. Yes, I'm an actor. Why would, would you cry? Yes, I would cry. I cry on stage. I'm an actor. I'm playing a role. Um, I've had people ask me, well, you know, you're a conservative and you have, you know, you're a Christian and you have these views about uh, certain things, but you've played homosexuals. Yes. Yes, I've played several homosexual men. What, but I'm, that doesn't mean, that means I acted the role and for my money did a hell of a job. I was very good because I'm an actor. Yes, I would put on a dress in a heartbeat. I, I wouldn't have any... The only question I would have about putting on a dress would be the same question you asked me earlier, which is, is this silly and stupid or is it in poor taste and I couldn't show my face in public? Uh, not in public, that I couldn't look my children in the eye. That's really the marker for me. What will my children say? Well, they see Daddy acted and, and he was in a dress, but it was a role that I played. Sure, I mean, would I, would, this is, this, here, here, this is how silly the question is. Would you have done, if, if, if the role of Tootsie had been offered to you, would you take it? Ask any actor that. Would you have, and you say, well, look, an actor of the caliber of Dustin Hoffman played the hell out of that. Would I have, have attempted to do that? Got a role like that where you could sink your teeth into it that would get you nominated for an Academy Award? Yes! Of course I would. It's a crazy question. Would I spend my entire career in a dress? Well, Jamie Farr, who had a career before MASH, but spent, what, 12, 10 seasons, 11 seasons wearing dress and bras and all those kinds of things. I think if you ask Jamie Farr, was, I mean, he would say, I had a great time. It was a great character. I made a boatload of money, sent my kids to college, bought a huge home, set my retirement, I'm set for life. Would you, would, would, would you play Klinger in M.A.S.H.? Yes. Without question, I grew up, um, it's got to be Sidney Poitier, um, who is someone who I, I've not met. I've had a couple of opportunities, in, but in part because uh, as a black actor, as an actor who is black is what I prefer, of course growing up, I mean, Sidney was the man. And then coming into the business when I did, and I have a feeling every black actor my age was compared to Sidney Poitier, was said, oh, you remind me of Sidney Poitier. But I used to get that quite a bit. And I always felt that it was an honor. And of course, I would say Angela Bassett, who I absolutely love, just in per as, as, as a person. But, um, and I think that there's something that about her genuineness that also comes across on screen. I mean, there's just, listen, you talk about moments in Waiting to Exhale, 
where she burns that car and walks away and does. There are a lot of people who could have done that scene who would, it wouldn't have been good, but nobody can touch how Angela played that. That's how she has this thing about her. I wrote a syndicated column on politics and culture for eight years. Um, I wrote a book and, and it was published. Uh, so I think of myself as a decent writer. Um, I wrote a one-man show. I'm a very good cook. <laughs> I went to culinary school uh, the first year. My wife and I were married. So I can, yeah, I think like most people, I, I think there are very few people who can just do one thing. And um, a lot of people have a lot of, or I would say most people have a lot of different things that they enjoy doing and can do to varying degrees of, of expertise. And so I have, you know, yeah, they're, now, will they translate to money? <laughs> That becomes an entirely different proposition. Although I have to say that I did make some money with writing because, um, like I said, I wrote a book and I made back my advance and, and actually I got a little residual check just the other day on my book. Um, my cooking skills, I now own a restaurant, a little uh, chicken wing place, and all of the recipes there are my own. I created it and... Um, the concept and all of that, so uh, so it has translated into into dollars.